over the years I have um, gathered knowledge and I have um, some of that was gathered through uh, my own life experiences at home, uh, living with the, with the family, living a traditional lifestyle, um, speaking the Cree language. And then some of it came from uh, academics and going to school and, and, and going to college and, and receiving programs there uh, where I learned um, more uh, about uh, specific uh, courses such as um, native cultural arts, that kind of thing. So um, the Cree language uh, was a experience. It was a, an experience that I've had um, through through my lifetime. Um, when I started working, I had the uh, opportunity to teach the Cree language program at the St. Stephen School in Valley View, and which is, Valley View is very close to um, our community here, Sturgeon Lake. Mm -hmm. So um, I had that, uh, the experience of, uh, of being able to work with um, other educators uh, of the region. We would go once a month and we would gather all those of us who were teaching the Cree language and learn from each other. Right. We sat with um, uh, an author, uh, Diane Mealy. She wrote, um, a book on uh, the elders' profiles. So she would give her input in there and we learned from her experiences as well. Um, so over the years uh, after that, I, I would be asked from time to time to, um, you know, uh, just to do a contract, maybe a short contract, uh, at one point, I was asked to, to teach traditional hide tanning. Mm -hmm. And I went to a, a dif different community where we spent three weeks there teaching the whole course from start to finish. And um, then another time, I was asked by the Traditional Paths Society in Grand Prairie to go and teach the Cree language. Mm -hmm. And so we t we, I was there to teach the basic uh, conversational Cree. Mm -hmm. And then last, this last uh, fall, I've completed another uh, pre-language program. And that one is, was more uh, uh, structured uh, with uh, grammar and right from um, kindergarten mm -hmm. all the way to grade 12. And then when I started teaching uh, the, in the communities, um, those were more probably the youth of about maybe 15 years of age to 29. Right. And then uh, another older group uh, with a Cree language course, yeah. those were kind of um, the youth uh, from age 15 all the way up to maybe 50 right. years old. So those were the people that were coming to these uh, courses. With all of the programs, it was all aimed at uh, um, to be able to give the skills and the knowledge um, regarding our culture, to capture um, skills and, and knowledge um, about who we are mm -hmm. as, as, a, as a Cree people. Um, and uh, I think no one can teach anything uh, without including language it seems and so I think that you always include that in anything that you do. Um, I like to do that myself. Um, for me it's um, it's very important that uh, if you're teaching the Cree language that you also explain the other parts um, about who we are as a people mm -hmm. um, because we are known as um, the uh, Enoch we are uh, people who, uh, who are very uh, intellectual. We're, 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 um, we're very um, intelligent people. And uh, when we do something like myself, whenever I do anything, I, I do it from the heart. Mm -hmm. And uh, I give 200% of myself uh, whenever I, I'm sharing any, any of my experiences, my life experiences, or mm -hmm. any teaching um, the Cree language, because teaching the Cree language is not just about learning the Cree words. 
there's so much more to it than that. When we're teaching our, our Cree language is very um, descriptive language, the Cree language. And the other thing is each community has their own way of, of, of pronouncing the words. But there are also word variations from one community to the next. It doesn't matter if this community, your neighboring communities are only 30 miles away from you. You will find that the culture is different. The teachings are different. The traditions may be different. And so even though there are some things such as like maybe making dry meat or processing fish or, you know, anything like that, berries, all those things are pretty much the same everywhere. But it's other things um, that are not. They're a little bit different, done, done differently from one community to the next. And so when you're teaching the Cree language, for example, there's so much that you, you need to think about, you need to consider when you are doing that. Because in one community, you might say one word and it's, and it's quite fine. It's describing perhaps food, uh, clothing. But in another community, that same word may be describing a, a body part or function. <laughs> <Something>. <laughs> so you have to be very careful um, in, in, in what, you're, what you're teaching. You need to really explain very carefully uh, what your uh, pre-sound system is. You have to be able to, to teach the Cree sound system and have your students learn it the way you do it in that community. Mm -hmm. So they know this is these teachings are coming from Sturgeon Lake Cree Nation, right. not from Sucker Creek mm -hmm. or from the Northlands community yeah. up here. They all speak Cree and we all, you know, basically use you know the same words, but there are some variations. Right. And uh, a lot of the other thing is there are a lot of hidden, um, there are a lot of hidden meanings when you're speaking with elders. Um, they don't always have to say anything. If you've lived that life, if you've lived the cultural lifestyle in a community, in a native community, you, if you were brought up that way and you were speaking your Cree language all the way through and you've lived through those old ways, there are some things that ne are never need to be said. Mm -hmm. They're just known. So I know for one example, in our community here, if a midwife was looking after a woman having a child, mm -hmm. they will usually give them herbs, an herbal tea to help them to, to go through the labor. And then the time comes when it's time to um, uh, release the placenta. But the women in that group will not use that word because in our way, we look at a woman's womb as being sacred. Mm -hmm. And so they won't even use that word. And they'll use the word kiwai, you know, when something is showing. So, kiwai tapakitin, something will need to fall. So that's the placenta that needs to come through and fall. So that's the end of, you know, and then they do their cleansing after that. But just those words themselves there, they don't use a word for placenta, mm -hmm. not in this community. It, mm -hmm. I don't ever remember hearing any of our my elders mm -hmm. using a right. word that would say yeah. placenta. They always right. use the word kiwi. Mm -hmm. And uh, another thing is when wow. a, a young girl is taught how to respect themselves, but also respect the opposite sex, and then and that and their their fathers, their grandfathers, any male that would come into the home, or their elders, any elder. Um, you know, little girls were taught from the time they're small, and to, they can't walk in front of their dad or their uncles or grandpa, um, just walk freely in front of them. They have to hold their dress 
they hold their dress tight in front of them and, and they walk by. And we were taught to not look at um, an elder in the eyes when, uh, when you're having a conversation with them. So some people would take that as being shy, but it wasn't. It was, it was to do with respect. So there are many things uh, that need to be understood when you're teaching the Cree language. You need to explain all these things thoroughly mm -hmm. because we are, like I said, the Inuak. We are the people um, with the, we understand about the four quadrants of a being. So when we look at a person, it's not just the, the physical being where we, we look at. We look at all the four parts of that person. So, um, niwiyaw is another word that we use for for us mm -hmm. you know, to describe who we are. Nihiawak. Our language is uh, It's uh, That's our language. The Cree word actually is not even uh, part of our language. That came to us through the missionaries and they called us uh, Christianese. And uh, when they're doing their reporting to their uh, to the government, all right. these agents that would come around, they would uh, uh, call us. We dropped us all the letters of the word Christianese except for the four, which spells out Cree. I do not agree with the way mm -hmm. they are pushing the Plains Cree onto us who are living here. In our own community, we have a teacher right now who is teaching Plains Cree way. That's completely different way of speaking it, but also... Because we're in the woodland. Region. We are the woodland Cree. Right. So there are many, like I said earlier, mm -hmm. from one community to the next, yeah. our cultures are different. Yes. They differ a certain amount <clears throat> to a certain amount. And um, so, yes, absolutely. If you are um, going to be teaching, if you are expecting teachers to go into uh, one region, mm -hmm. then send educators that are from that region right. and have grown, have been there and lived that life, that, that yeah. know their community. Right. They must be able to, yeah. to um take that knowledge from their own experiences and not borrow knowledge from other places. Uh -huh. We are getting, so many of our young people are becoming more and more confused about who they are because so many other mm -hmm. communities, other people from other communities are having to come to here to teach us. And I feel sad because my own grandfather, he was a lodge man. And I remembered asking him if he was going to pass on his bundle to anyone in our family, and he said no. And I asked why, and he said, He was saying, we are not, it's like we are foolish, because our minds have been contaminated oh. <laughs> somehow. It's like uh, because of the Western influence. Right. So some of us ended up in the residential school and uh, we learned a whole different way of doing things. In fact, we were, many of us were, were uh, we, we came out of there not speaking our language. We just, where, wherever we were, we, we left off when we left to go to school, that's all we had when we came out. We never learned anymore. Um, we, we would go home speaking the English language and our grandmothers and grandfathers or our parents would be upset with us because we were only speaking the, the English language and not, not our own language anymore. Okay. And so I, I feel Polish. really, yeah, I feel like, like he, he felt, I think that he meant that wow. um, we were influenced by the Western society and so we were not immersed in our own culture anymore. And so because we are this, and now when I said contaminated, our minds are contaminated, I'm talking about other influences coming in, and that interferes with what you had before you left home. 
So um, they did not want to pass on those uh, their bundles to us and their songs. We here in our community, there's I don't know of anybody who really knows those old ways anymore. And we have, and sadly, we have to go to other communities, you know, to learn about the sun dance, to learn about, you know, sweat lodge, all these sacred ceremonies that are happening are being brought to us from other communities. Mm -hmm. So our community now is becoming influenced by that. And so those of us who still remember the old ways, it's very important for us to teach what we've, what we still remember. Excellence would be learning it right from the time you were born. And you're being taught by your own people how to live your life, how to respect yourself, how to respect your people and everything you are given and to know the protocols, to be able to know your language fluently. You have to live that lifestyle. When you go to the schools today, you're given only this much time to learn this course. For, for example, when I'm teaching the Cree language, mm -hmm. I was given eight classes and I'm expected to teach um, a conversational Cree course. What do you learn in that length of time? Basically, all you walk away with is a Cree sound system. Mm -hmm. You barely get into the actual mm -hmm. conversational Cree by, by the time you've done two hours each lesson. It's not enough. It's just not enough. Excellence would be those, those students, if they really want to learn that language, go and stay with someone for maybe five years. Learn them what they're doing, all the ways, how to make dry meat, how to process fish, make smoked fish. You know, learn how to, to take care of berries, how to pick herbal medicines. Mm -hmm. All these ways, learn the, the ways of the land. Right. The land could teach you so much. There's so much to learn about it. So for me, if you're talking about excellence, that's what it's going to take. How would I measure the success? Just simply by having to be able to sit down with that individual mm -hmm. and to see them do the things that they'd been taught. Right. So if I was, you stayed with me, for example, for five years, and we were here and learning how to make dry meat, learning how to do hide tanning, learning how to do moxins, all these different things, making bannock, preparing our foods, our traditional foods. Okay, how would I measure that? By watching you, by looking at how well you can do something for me. I can say to you, can you please go and do this? Go and set that up for me. Yeah. And you should be able to get out there and do it. And I don't, should not have to go out there and adjust anything fix or yeah. fix anything. It should be perfect. Right. So that to me would be excellence. Right. That would be how I would measure it. And how you carry yourself, mm -hmm. the confidence that you have. And then being able to see the individual that you are would be drawn out when you're speaking the language. You're able to understand everything I'm saying to you. You'd be able to be involved in it. You can practice what you've learned. So we can sit here as two individuals, completely independent. That uh, would be how I would measure. You have to live the lifestyle. Right. That's, that's, you got to spend yeah. time. You have to devote yourself to it. Yeah. It's like going to university right. and you want to learn to become an anthropologist or whatever. Yeah. You want to become, you know, somebody, something yeah. specific. You're going to spend years at it. Mm -hmm. 
before you can come back to say you're a professional. Right. You're going to have your experiences. Yeah. You're going to have to go through the hardships of, yeah. of learning yeah. whatever it is that you wanted, you know, and, and gaining whatever it is that you wanted to achieve. Right. It's the same thing here. You have to spend time with your elders. Right. Indigenous education, yes, it can fit into the, the universities as well. Um, but it would have to be, to me, I, I, I think about some of the people that have, uh, that I have seen go to the universities. And some of them, I think, um, really can come from uh, that place of, of already knowing who you are when you get there. And then you just add on to that. You add right. more to it. Um, but then you have to come back and use that education in your own community. Right. I think, to me, that goes full circle. Mm -hmm. So it's not just going to university and then coming home and forgetting about what you've done there. Right. Otherwise, Because if you do that, it means nothing then. You didn't learn anything. I feel like you didn't respect it enough and just, you know, it was, it's like going there just to get the paper. Yeah. So you can go and get a job somewhere so you can yeah. earn big, big dollars or whatever. <laughs> I think you have to bring it back to your community and use yeah. it there. Like here in our community, I work, I have worked with the, uh, the uh, traditional land use um, study. I've, I've been in many projects uh, with consultation as well and um, we sure could use people you know if we have had our own our own professionals that could come back to our communities and help us out here we could go get we could achieve a whole lot more right. but we we don't have any anyone that's here that's uh, you know uh, archaeologist mm -hmm. I would love to be able to have somebody from my own community that's an archaeologist right. a paleontologist or yes. or someone you know that uh, has had that education to, to come and help us improve our programs for indigenous education yes you I think it's not just saying I'm gonna go and and be a, um archaeologist, mm -hmm. go bring it back and do something with it. Right. If, if uh, you're going to be a linguist, help us with it. We could learn. We could learn a lot from you. I've always said education is important mm -hmm. because even though we are First Nation and we should learn about who we are, we also need to learn about what's going on in the world so we can balance that. We can, we need to have, I mean, look at us today. We are here, First Nations, in consultations, for example. Um, we're worried about our lands, our traditional lands, mm -hmm. and how oil and gas industry, the transportation, there's, there's the um, other, other industries that are uh, tearing up our lands and and just taking over a lot of our old traditional territory, mm -hmm. and our water is being used up. And there, it seems to me like I'm not hearing enough people saying we have to worry about our future generations. Where is the water going to come from if we use it all up by uh, doing? all of these mm -hmm. um, fracking and all of this that they're right. doing. You know, I just feel like we need to, we need to be able to uh, bring more people to school, get them educated so that they can come back and help us stand up for who we are, mm -hmm. fight, for what we believe is, is a good cause. Right. 
such as saving our water for our future generations. Mm -hmm. And it's not just our First Nations who are going to, to benefit from it. It's everyone in this Alberta. It's everyone all over. We all need water. We all need water. Water is life. And so, you know, it's important uh, water that's going to sustain life for everything, for the plants, the aquatic, the aquatic, um, you know, anything that's um, lives in water. Um, there's there's nesting that goes on along the the these, uh, you know, uh, flood flood plains. There's uh, fish that are coming in there and and. Uh, Marshes. Oh, there's so much. There's so much. Muskeg. There's so many things that need to be looked at, and yeah. muskegs are filtering systems, and uh, you know those are things that are important to us. And if mm -hmm. we keep on just not saying anything, you know, if we don't in encourage our young people to go to school mm -hmm. and come back and fight for our, for right. these rights. Um, then in the end, we're going to lose out a lot. Well, and it might be too late. That was something I wish we could do, is to have our people who are going out to get their education, to bring it back to their communities and help their people. Mm -hmm. Help them to stand up for what they believe in. There are so many people that are good leaders. Right. And there are those who are willing to fight, but they need someone that could speak really well for them. So this is what I wish would happen. We need to change uh, how we think today. Uh -huh. We're just sitting and just accepting whatever is being thrown at us. And it's not, it's right. not a good way to be. Okay, We're losing. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. We need to change the way that's being done. So, mm -hmm. we need elders to speak up and mm -hmm. share the knowledge of, cause, yeah. because, you know, everything that we have today is, is here because of oral tradition. Yes. That's another thing that's important. Our stories are important. It's about our history, you know. And passing it's on that whole, knowledge. It's passing that on. And so important to, to give it to those, to those younger generations. Yeah. They then become the custodians of knowledge. I feel as though too many of our, and I, and I hope that this isn't taken in a bad way, but I feel like I go to these, to these, um, places where they're, um, they have groups sitting together and then you have elders who come in. We feel insignificant sometimes mm -hmm. because of the people and the way they speak to us. Mm -hmm. They speak to us with a language we don't even understand. Mm -hmm. You have expensive words sometimes. Mm -hmm. I can't follow what you're saying to us mm -hmm. sometimes. Right. So talk to us at our level. Mm -hmm. Talk to us as who we are. Mm -hmm. You know, we know we, we you you could learn a lot from from that. Listen to us. Mm -hmm. Start listening to who we are. Provide you know, opportunities for us to, to participate more. Mm -hmm. Not just one elder, mm -hmm. but groups of us. Mm -hmm. Because when you put more heads together, man, you can get a whole lot out of that, out mm -hmm. of those sessions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, for example, mm -hmm. one of the things that uh, I think that was happening here at one time was they had all the elders come in and uh, through the consultation program, uh, there was an, a young woman who came in and, and sat, had, sat with the elders for three days. Mm -hmm. And they, all they did was uh, to look at the maps. Mm -hmm. And the elders named, yeah. gave them all the place names in Cree. Okay. And told their stories about each one of those place names. Mm -hmm. That in itself is, holds a lot. Yeah. 
there's a whole lot of history that's being shared right there. And then you get to see a map of what this place is all about. Why did they call this mm -hmm. House River just up the road here? Yeah. They call that House River mm -hmm. because uh, because just down the road from where the highway is, just up up the the river, a few couple miles, there's an area there where the the river turns and is shaped in such a way that it looks like a house. You need to provide an area, a mm -hmm. space to be able to do that. Okay. One thing you know, they have these environmental uh, areas where they have uh, parks and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Why don't they preserve an area where we can go and do cultural teachings for different groups, for the Blackfoot to have a, a place near their, yeah. their home? In our area here, provide a place here where we can teach you that, these things. Mm -hmm. You know, I had dreamed of a place where you could have everything set up so you can bring in different age groups to learn different things mm -hmm. and just to live there, to learn these things. Right. If you want to become a hunter, okay. you have to have, on. yeah, you I have to feel. Absolutely. It's right. so important to do that. When I used to teach the Cree language, yeah. I would set up the whole room mm -hmm. based on whatever it, it was I was teaching, whatever, um, I would do it by um, seasons. Right. So if it was fall time, what did the First Nations do in the fall time? Right. What, what were the activities that were being done? Mm -hmm. And so then you would have all the shelters that would be up. You would have, you know, uh, everything set up in the, in the whole classroom. And um, the names of things in the classroom, like where, depending on whatever it is right. that you're showing, if it's geese flying down, maybe there's nest, they're nesting, then you would have it written yeah. up there as well. Right. Maybe there's a story about it there. Very visual. Very visual. You have to it's feel, feeling yeah. things, touching things, smelling things, seeing. Yes. You've got to be able to do that. That's how we learn. Yes. Most mm. First Nations people learn by... Very experiential. Yeah, right. hands-on. Hands it has to be yeah. hands-on. Many of here. us learn. I hear so many of the students tell me that. Yeah. Draw it out for me. Yeah. Show me. See it. I need to be able to see it because I don't know what you mean right. when you explain it on the board, you yeah. know. So they, many of them, they, they want it on the board, right. but they also want to be able to, to see you doing it. Mm -hmm. They want to see a video. They want you to sit beside them and show them. Mm -hmm. So if, say if you're teaching how to sew moccasins, mm -hmm. how do you cut the patterns out? Which way do you lay your, your hide? Yeah. Why is that important? Mm -hmm. You know, all these things, there's so much to learn. Yeah. So I think uh, mm -hmm. if you want to learn about face painting, take the students out to an area where there's some natural, uh, natural things that you can take from the ground, from the earth, from other earth, and teach them right there what, what those... Uh, what that material is or what whatever substance it is right. um, ochre go and show them the different colors of ochre right. where do you find it how do you use it when do you use it why is it important you know yeah. to use it a specific way there's protocols for everything you have to mm -hmm. teach them all these things you have to bring them out there make them feel breathe in the air be a part of that place it's so just you remember. so because that is how you remember. Yeah. You can so remember that experience. You'll never forget Smell. the birds that, that are sitting in the trees that are singing, the wind that's blowing, the little breeze, you know, yeah. little stream trickling by, or whatever experience yeah. that you had out there. Yeah. There's so much more to learning something. Yeah. Absolutely. Because it includes the whole four quadrants 
of a being because when we, we know the protocol is whenever you go out, you always put tobacco and ask permission to take something. You never just go and take. It has to be done right. You want to. There are, I've, I really worry about the people that are, um, they borrow knowledge. There are some people who are so, I always like to caution my, my young people, anybody who comes and sits in front of me, if I'm teaching them something. I always like to remind them that there are people out there looking for recognition and power. Watch out for those ones. They're the ones who like to stand up there in the limelight. If they're... If there is a person doing that, watch it. The ones who are humble, the ones who are who still sit quietly in the corner somewhere, mm -hmm. sit quietly. Those ones many times know more than the one that's speaking up there. The one who's speaking up there is, might be borrowed, might be using borrowed knowledge, has not actually experienced things. They just heard things. It wasn't their experience. They okay. never lived it. Okay. They just borrowed that right. information. They just took it. Yes. And then they went and used it somewhere else and gained, got paid for it. Okay. Let's see. They look good up there. All of a sudden, their name is all over the place. But they never earned that place because they didn't live it. Mm -hmm. They don't even understand what they're talking about. But they like to use fancy words up there. They like to romanticize everything. It's not the way to do things. Many times I go to a university or some place where I listen to people talk. Mm -hmm. I can tell right away when someone is doing that. Mm -hmm. There are those who show off up there. We have to be very careful that uh, when we're in a, in a... Just because someone says elder doesn't mean that that person earned that place. Because, like I said, maybe they didn't walk the talk. They never experienced it. They never lived it. Right. They just took it from a book. They read it. They borrowed that knowledge. Copy. Or they went to a conference and they heard somebody speak. They took notes and they took that for themselves. Mm -hmm. Go and live that experience. Go to that elder. Give them tobacco and say, I want to learn from you. Mm -hmm. Would you be my teacher? Would you teach me about that? Be humble. Be humble. About it. Humble yourself. I know nothing. Absolutely. That's where we have to begin. When you sit quiet and you listen, you'll learn so much more. When I first started my healing journey, I never realized that I had problems until I was in my late 30s. I had gone to school and I was learning to be a CHR mm -hmm. and uh, I had taken mental health and communications and it's in that program where I realized, oh, maybe I need to start looking at my, my life during these times. What happened and why am I such a perfectionist? Yeah. Why do I set such high standards and I actually meet them? Yeah. <laughs> I work so much, so hard to gain that place of acceptance. I wanted acceptance because I had felt so little when I was in the residential school. Right. You know. So I think in those times I... I realized then that I needed to learn more about myself and so I started to go to the elders, brought tobacco and I started going to sweats and mm -hmm. sun dances and I started fasting and I started walking that healing journey. I went mm -hmm. to AA meetings, I, I had a sponsor, I, I, did, I learned so many things about myself in that 10 year span. I then when I was in my late 30s, like I said, I didn't even realize up to that point. Mm -hmm. I thought everybody else had the problems. I didn't know that part of it was me.
Right. And so some of us in this community here, I think that's what happened to us. Because when your parents were in the residential school, it's going to affect uh, the future generations. It's an intergenerational, I think they call it. Yeah. It, it keeps going. <clears throat> yeah. Someone has to break that cycle. And uh, we need to learn. We need to, to heal. And that's what I did. I had to do that first. Then I began learning about all the other things. And one of the things that I learned about myself is that I was asking a thousand questions and not listening to the answers coming back to me. So then I wondered why it was taking me so long to learn something <laughs> until somebody <laughs> finally sat me down and explained it to me, put me in my place and said, listen. So, yeah, that's um, important to listen.